I had Julie Meyer on one of the calls with me talking about the, the sounds that release prophecy. There's, there's a sound, Elisha, when he was going to prophesy, he said, bring me a harpist. And that everybody, there's a sound that actually releases prophecy. And there's different things in the spirit that, um, that catalyze, that become a catalyst for a prophetic word. And, and, and uh, there, you know, different, different uh, things. I, I was in IHOP this week. Did I say this last night about being in IHOP this week? And about the guy with the 500 billion trees? No. Oh, oh, it was crazy. It was like, we got the, one of the sets, I don't even know who the guy's name was. I'm sitting there, and he begins to clap. And, and everybody has a sound that when they hear that sound, their spirit goes off. I, I, I believe that. And, and creation, he was... He was um, singing Romans 8 about all creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. And I know in history, you know, recent history in the last century, there was a heresy that built up about that, but it's still in the Bible. And there is still, the Bible truth goes over every heresy, okay? Right, so you right, probably right. know what I'm talking about, right? That, about the latter rain. But anyway, they, and that was amazing signs and wonders movement. But, but oftentimes, the end of prophetic movements go awry because people don't know how to stay rooted and grounded in the word of God and they don't understand the whole Galatians thing where if I or an angel from heaven comes and preaches any other gospel it's to be accursed and a lot of times the great danger of prophetic movements is that they learn to live out of their personal revelations instead of being rooted and grounded in the word of God so I want to encourage you the more you, you'll become more prophetic the more that you read the Bible meditate on the law of God it won't decrease your prophetic spirit to understand, to ask for the seven spirits of God, you know, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of understanding, spirit of knowledge. I could tell you crazy stories about different manifestations, but I, I, I would encourage you to invest. This little thing is bigger than it is. It is, you know, fathers that are alive today praying the Bible, okay? So we got Lou Engel here praying scripture prayers for extreme disciples. We've got, you know, uh, James Gall praying prayers for Israel. If you know that you have a calling for Israel, that him praying that. We got Mike Bickle praying the Song of Solomon. We've got uh, Mike Bickle praying the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mike Bickle praying apostolic prayers. Wesley Campbell praying psalms and hymns. I don't think prayers from that. We got children's prayers on there. How to teach another generation to pray the Bible, but it's all Bible-based prayers. And then Fireland, which is just live intercession. You know, if you like drums and Celtic music, it's really wild and crazy. But then there's, that, that's not just these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's another six instrumental CDs and maybe, you know, on there so that once you have the Bible, you know, somebody else praying the Bible for you, you can just put on the instrumental versions, then there are extra inter instrumental versions on there, that, that, so that you can put on uh, uh, music like Elisha and, you know, then get into the Word of God yourself. So I really encourage you to do that. So um, if uh, that's just out there at the book table. But I want to talk uh, today, um, uh, I, I don't have time, but I was in the IHOP. I'll finish that story, okay? I'll finish that story. I was in IHOP this week, and so the guy, they began to pray Romans 8 and sing, sing Romans 8 and about all of creation groaning. And I remember reading on CNN or somewhere about the sounds of the glaciers, that they actually glaciers make a sound that sounds like singing when they move, and they're, they're always moving, the waters are moving and stuff, and it, there's a, a sound coming off of the glaciers, and really much of creation is is groaning even in our generation next week I'm doing a prophetic conference in San Clemente and I've invited marine biologists who are believers to come because one of the the, the movements that we must raise up in our generation is the protectors of creation because we we work a lot with poverty uh, Wesley and I, uh, you know, have a, um, we care for, right, currently right now, 3,000 orphans every single day in Be a Hero. And we, but in addition to that, we built homes. Just this past year, we built eight to 10 homes in the Philippines alone to take girls out of the sex trade, five to 12 year old girls. I mean, all over the world, we, this is what we do. We raise money for the things plus the daily sponsorship. And Wesley's goal is a million children, so we've barely begun. 
But, but however, uh, you know, one of the, th uh, I was at this uh, European Economic Summit in, that was started out of the Dutch Prophetic Council. I'm telling you, we need prophecy. Uh, we need prophecy in this hour. I, need, I understand apostles and, and, and it's first apostles, second prophets. I understand how when God builds. But out of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, in the context of 1 Corinthians 12, more than healing, more than, you know, gifts of miracles, more than any of that. Yeah, then we have 1 Corinthians 13. But in the context, it says, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy, more than mercy. You know, if I give my body to be burned, even more than martyrdom, you know, especially more because it says if I give all that I have to the poor, you know, in that context, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 comes up and says, eagerly desire all those spiritual gifts, like we should be hungry for them, but especially more than any other gift, especially prophecy, because prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And prophecy is generally the first gift to go in any movement. The, it's, it, you know, even in the New Testament, it says, D don't despise prophetic utterances. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't say don't despise teachers or anything. The, it's easy to despise prophets because we're weird. Right. <laughs> okay? And there's always a stigma attached to prophets. It's because God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And that many people don't want to have prophecy because it's also uncontrollable in a certain way. You know, every other thing, and that's the problem of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, they would build up around the teaching, you know, too many structures until they actually squeezed God himself out and couldn't recognize him when he came. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really important for us to be able to discern by the Spirit, not by exterior judgments, but we know our Bible so well that we can easily discern what's of the Spirit and what's not. And we are also so confident and rooted and grounded in the love of God that we're not afraid to let wheat and tares grow together. You know, we're not always pulling out little tears all the time because we might lose some wheat if we get doing that. So there's a confidence in God and we know when to sip in, when not to sip in, when, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's necessary to, 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 uh, to discern movements of God if we try to pull things out too easily. So anyway, I'm getting back to my point here of being at IHOP and, uh, uh, so he begins to sing and about the creation and Romans eight and longing and and suddenly he he says you know if 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 we don't sing out if we don't worship rocks and stones they're going to begin to cry out and he said and then he begins to sing on the trees of the fields will begin to clap their hands and he starts clapping and on that clapping sound he, I'm telling you he just had this incredible clap the whole room stopped at the clap because there are sounds that open the realm of the spirit and then he goes the sound of 500 billion trees clapping their hands and worship to God and I mean it was like it was a crazy moment you should get that set you should just go back in the history I don't even know the guy's name I could tell you but it was this week I think it was Thursday two to four is it Thursday it was Thursday two to four I think it was but it's a great set short the blonde hair, the guy leading it. It is worth going to hear that sound just for that moment of clapping. I'm telling you, you know, David said, I'd rather spend, you know, one day, one day in your house is better than a thousand elsewhere. And when you catch a moment in God, it's worth a thousand moments elsewhere. It's worth, you know, it's worth sitting through six hours for that one moment, like that brother there, where it landed on you all your life, you know what I mean? Praying, asking, watching, seeing, and then boom, the moment happens where you not only know it and believe it, but you experience it where you taste and see that, that God is good. You, you encounter God at deeper levels and we all should be going ever, ever deeper. Uh, so, uh, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, I, 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 I have a lot of what I'm going to speak on today in my book, Ecstatic Prophecy, which I highly encourage you to get. Because I feel like most people don't know church history. Many people read the Bible with certain cultural lenses. And, and oftentimes we don't understand. I, 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 this is my personal experience as a, as a Baptist and cessationist, uh, that I, uh, I was taught, and I, I think I shared this here last year, I was taught that people that do what I do were emotionally disturbed at best and demon-possessed at worst. Yeah. 
And you know, that, that God was a gentleman. I even heard those words from pulpits. God is a gentleman. You know, now I go, have not people ever read their Bible? Like, do they not read it? <laughs> do they not read what the word of God says? You know, over and over, and he wouldn't make you do anything against his will. Have they not read the Bible? Like, do you know how many people did things against their, their wills? You know, especially in prophetic encounters, you know, they were overcome by the Spirit of God. And they began to do things that they never would have ever done in normal life out of their personality. And when the Spirit of God came on them, they were changed into absolutely different people. They were changed. You can read Judges, Book of Judges, over and over. You know, Gideon's like, eh, you know, and the angel of the Lord comes and says something. You mighty man of Elder, and he argues with the angel of the Lord because he's not that way he's changed into a different person you know simply by an encounter with God that's not what he expected and so I want to talk about this today because it's actually very critical um, a for the last days and speaking as a cessationist I, I was taught that prophecy ceased I was from the denomination you know founded by J Nelson Darby that in the late 1800 early 1800s began to say that uh, uh, teach cessationism you know in 1800 church, years of church history they never ever taught cessationism for the most part like I just wasn't there but it began to be dominant after 1800 years and why because J Nelson Darby reduced the Bible to his personal experience instead of increased his personal experience to the Bible. It's what the Pharisees did. It's what the Sadducees did. You know, they just made it little laws and God moved like this and not like this without saying, okay, if it's in there, you know, how do we increase our life into that, that, that dimension that God expects from us? And it's, it's for all believers. Like when he would say things like John 14, if you believe in me, then greater works than me will you do. That's not for, that's like a whosoever will text. It's not for like a few people. It's, it's anybody that believes in him. The expectation is if there's real belief, there will be greater works coming out of your life. So if you read what Jesus did, then read it. If you believe in him, those kind of works should come out of your life. It's just greater than that in there, you know? So, so we have to read it because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's where we get out of our teeny weeny mindsets. But J. Nelson Darby said, Wow, when I read the Bible, it's like all this stuff is happening in the life of Jesus. There's miracles everywhere. And in the book of Ma Acts, there's miracles everywhere. He said, but by the time you get to the epistles, it seems like there's less and less miracles, you know? And, you know, then when you get to church history, and of course, he didn't have the, the luxury of all the technology we have now and the ability to go into church history. So, you know, the books were limited that he had at the time and the ability to go into original uh, uh, texts, etc., and libraries all over the world. He said, it seems like it died out. So he went back to the Bible and began to say, well, you see, when the perfect comes, and then he correlated the, the arrival of the perfect with the canon of scripture. And then he said, now that we have the perfect word of God, because the law of the Lord is perfect, we don't need miracles or signs or wonders or anything like that anymore. And he basically said, you know, because I haven't seen it, it's not happening in England. Well, then it probably isn't going to isn't happening anymore. But rather, you know, that's just like Thomas. Thomas said, unless I touch his hands, unless he, you know, I put my hand in the print of his nail, unless I, uh, you know, whatever he else he said, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And he reduced the resurrection, even though it was testified everywhere, there were eyewitnesses that already came, he reduced the resurrection to his lack of personal experience. Wow. That's not a good thing to do. Yeah. It's good to read it, and if it says it, then we believe it. We put, we mix our faith with what God says about himself and with what God says about people who believe in him that they will do. So, um, 
You know, uh, Wesley uh, said, success, success to you. I want to talk to you today about how you can increase your success. And you're already doing it, so I am preaching to the converted, you know. But what I, but, because uh, this is a, cr a group that's really pressing in. And, and if you read the history of revival, revival comes from contexts like this. So my husband is a revivalist. He's read it, and I'm going to go through a little bit. But I, I want to start with the Bible. What you, the last thing Jesus said to the disciples, there were, you know, last 120 that were hanging around when he was ascending into heaven. He says this in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power from on high, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You are a situation, a worldwide situation. How do you become a situation, a catalyst for a worldwide movement, a little tiny group in an upper room? That's what he said to them. And he said, go wait until you get that power. Just go wait there. Just go. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up with wings like evil, e eagles, you know? And, and that's what's going to happen. So this is a pattern. What was the purpose of the power? You'll receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. What was the purpose of the power? Ka-ching, to be a witness. The purpose of power is to be a witness, is to become a catalyst, to be a situation. You know what I mean? To be a conduit for, for, the, for the revelation of who God is outside the walls of this room. And when the power fell, what did it look like in the Holy Bible? Uh, not really fire, but you're close. Not really tongues, but you're close. I mean, did, did fire and tongues were, were part of the thing? Uh, wind was there also? Uh -uh. Drunk. Okay, there we go. Okay. That's what it really looked like. That was the overwhelming manifestation. Okay. All of them were filled, everybody say filled. filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what that's like? That's, I want to suggest to you that's a desired state. Okay? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And like I like to say to Western cultures, I don't have to say this to African cultures. I don't have to say this to indigenous cultures. I have to say this to Western cultures. They were not just filled in their mind. They were filled. They were filled. They were filled, you know. And then they began out of the filling to, to uh, what does it say? To speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Okay, but when they were speaking in those other languages, what were they saying? Yeah, they were declaring the mighty works of God in their own languages. They were prophesying about who God is, about what God does, his mighty awesome works, and he was they were prophesying it in such a way that everybody in the in the in the in the area could understand them. Now, amazed and perplexed, other people were watching verse 12 and said, you know, and were mocking them because when you look at it from the outside to the undiscerning, you know, critic to the skeptic to the person says you know we don't really need that that's emotionalism you know that's you know demon possession or whatever if you have a, a, an unbiblical mindset or a cultural you know paradigm they actually jews we're talking jews here we're not talking, you know, the Gentile. The, we're talking mostly Jews in this in this context. Jews from different regions, uh, they some began to make fun of them. Why? Why would people make fun of people being filled with the Holy Spirit? Because it looked weird. They didn't understand. It looked weird. I always want people to read their Bibles, because. Most of the time when men and women were filled with God, prophecy in particular from the Old and New Testaments, from the earliest time where you see the school of the prophets recorded with Samuel, everything was weird. You know what I mean? There's music going on. They had their sounds. They're coming down from the high places. But when Saul is sent in there, he sends a battalion of soldiers, they begin involuntarily prophesying. You know, Saul sends three battalions. You know the story. And at, when he comes out, he's, he's lying all day, all night on the ground, prophesying naked. 
I want to suggest to you. Don't do that. No, no, I'm not suggesting that. You went too far. You be. But that was not that was not God being a gentleman. That was God filling Saul. And this is going to happen to believers and unbelievers alike because it's really clear from the context of Acts 2. The exegesis that Peter uses for the experience of the early church. This is what we were birthed in. If you're a Gentile in this room, you know, if you're the early church, the, the, this was the Jewish church. The, the, uh, Peter's exegesis of the Holy Spirit coming upon the church was says this. You know, because there were the people were looking at it from the outside, mocking it, saying, "You know, they got too much wine. What are these people? They're just weird." Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, addressed the crowd, "Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. These people are not drunk, as you suppose." Now, I don't know if you've ever studied the ways of God. That was a prayer of Moses at the end of Moses' life, right before he prayed, "Show me your glory." Kind of the life-threatening prayer. You know, right before that, Exodus 33, he prays this, um, you know, if I found favor in your sight, teach me your ways so that I can find favor in your sight. Now, this is a man that's already seen a burning bush, that's already released the ten plagues, ten in judgments of God, that's led a people through the wilderness, that's been 40 years almost there in the wilderness, that's been fed every day by the power of God, that's been up on a mountain in Exodus 24 with the 70 elders that shook, you know, prepared, already received the Ten Commandments, ate and drank with, you know, with God and the 70 elders of Israel on the Sapphire Sea. And at the end of his life, he's praying this prayer. Teach me your ways. I don't know if you've ever studied the ways of God to look for the ways, how God moves. His ways are higher than our ways. You know, his thoughts are higher. His, is that how it says? His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways still higher. Okay, I just suddenly my, you know, when you get 54, there's whole things that you know, they're there. And there's just like a, zzz, you know, just it's gone from your memory. Uh, <clears throat> but so... I, I, I want to encourage you to go into the Bible and study the ways of God because when God moves on people, this type of behavior is going to increase in the last days. Amen. It's not going to decrease like I was taught and taught in Baptist seminary. This type of behavior is what the church was birthed in. It's called power from on high and the purpose of the power is to be a witness. And it's going to increase in the last days, not decrease. It's going to happen more and more with ever increasing glory until every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Peter's exegesis of this, he says, these men are not drunk like you think. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what Joel's talking about. This is what is going to happen in the last days. I will pour out my spirit. Everybody say pour. Pour out my spirit. Okay. And, and your son, what's and the primary manifestation of the outpouring of the Spirit is prophecy. Yeah. It's the primary manifestation of the outpouring of the prophet of the Spirit. Because it says this, In the last days I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Prophecy is going to increase to the point where there is a global manifestation of the very testimony of Jesus. Because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. You know, uh, uh, Revelation 19. And can you imagine having local churches with no testimony of Jesus? Sad but true. I was at this awesome little church last week, you know, and, and uh, you know, two or three prophets, you don't have to take over the service with it, but, but it, you, if to actually, ha I, I know church, local churches that go months, weeks, years, or don't even have it at all, ever. 
So don't tell me this, one of my pet peeves. However, you know, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And at the end of the end, he will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs below. Like this was partially fulfilled with the 120, but not all these wonders in the heavens, signs on the earth below, blood, fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. This is an end time right. happening. This is not what already, this is an end time happening. It has not happened to all flesh yet where the spirit has been poured out yet. And I want to say this, I recently read a book, uh, copyright 2012, chronicled the time between 2007 and 2012. And it was called Miraculous Moments. It was written by a man named Jerry Truesdale. I highly encourage you to get it. Moments, okay, Miraculous Moments. The subtitle was, How Hundreds of Thousands of Muslims Are Coming to Christ Now. And it, it talked about, since 2007 to 2012, as such an increase of the outpouring of the Spirit on Islamic cultures in closed nations where missionaries couldn't even get in. These testimonies, it opened with this story of a, an imam that was from a, you know, in a closed Islamic country that had an Apostle Paul conversion, just like the Apostle Paul, you know, on his way to kill Christians. Apostle Paul, you know, had a blinding light, was blind for until, and who prayed for him? Ananias prayed for him, you know, and uh, anyway, but this guy never became unblind. He was so blinded, Jesus appeared to him basically with a, a similar, you know, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? A similar kind of story. Anyway, this, now this imam, blind, this blind imam is going all through this closed country preaching the gospel, and it began page, chapter after chapter, page after page, you know, whole mosques are coming to Christ, uh, imams are coming to Christ, all of them without a preacher almost, because God is pouring out his spirit in an ever increasing and it's all it's all dreams visions prophecy angelic encounters this is not history this is destiny this is your destiny you know and so and this is a great day to be alive and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved that 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 he ends with that portion and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved now do you see the direct correlation between movements of prophecy and and harvest and revival Boom, boom, boom. And that's exactly what happened because the power was for them to be a witness. That was the purpose of the power. And what happened after the weird behavior. Now, mind you, if you've read the Old Testament, drunkenness is a sin in the Old Testament. Don't be one who tarries long at the wine until your nose are red, you know, and, and your eyes are running kind of thing. It goes, it, it, you know, drunkenness is not holy. Okay, if you drink to excess, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You're supposed to be so filled that you're, you're filled that it's actually visible. <laughs> don't be drunk with wine. I mean, that, it's a direct in the Bible like that. Be so filled with the Spirit that everybody can tell. <laughs> you know, come on, come on. Because the power was for them to be a witness. And the power looked like, you know, physical external manifestations that resembled drunkenness, totally filled or possessed by God. And the power was prophetic pro 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 power. Now, the result of that was that 3,000 Jews were saved in a day. Possibly an hour, possibly 10 minutes. Because that's the purpose of this kind of power. The purpose, we can't lose the purpose into just like a happy me meeting. You know, it's a situation. It's a catalyst. It's got a goal to it. If we just internalize it and keep it within the walls here, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to see it. And so, like I said, from Toronto, I mean, Heidi Baker was already a missionary for 10 years before she ever showed up in Toronto with Jackie Pullinger in Hong Kong working with drug addicts. She shows up in Toronto for five days like Jonathan Edwards' wife. For five days, Jonathan Edwards' wife, you had to carry her in and out. Five days, 
she got filled in her body, in her spirit, in her mind, in her soul, because we're supposed to love God with all our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind, all of it. It's absolutely, you know, God possession, you know. <laughs> and she goes to the poorest country in the world, and, you know, I'm, I'm on her board. Now there's like 30 thousand I think 20 some thousand churches starting in the poorest country of the world and it, but she'd already been a missionary for 10 years and didn't see those kind of results she already spoke in tongues she was already Pentecostal but when she got filled with God you know something out of nothing this is who God is and so but we, so it's but it's for something it's unto something it's unto a purpose and this is the purpose the the result 3,000 saved in a day possibly an hour and let me let me let me just tell you the context of those Jews in Jerusalem that day these were not happy Jews on the way to a renewal meeting hey you know let's go get drug and spirit no these were hardened Jews who less than you know, two months earlier had been shouting on the same streets of the same small town with at the top of their lungs, crucify him, crucify him. That actually, you know, when you get to Stephen, it's when Stephen's describing what happened, you with your own wicked hands, crucify, you know, like, yeah, so he, he, he goes, kind of goes on about that. Uh, you know, so it's not like it was something they were expecting, expecting, but when the purpose of power is to become a situation, is to become a catalyst. These, these words are really what God wants you to be. And, and so that you're waiting on the Lord. It took him 10 days, you know, it, it, it took, sometimes you'll be sowing like, like this brother here, you know, desiring it for a long time. It all starts with desire. What I'm talking about is the kingdom of whoever wants it. The kingdom of whosoever will. This is, you know, this is for anybody who wants it. And if you read a book, say like God's generals, or you, you can go into, you know, you can go into centuries past. You can go into the trees of Avila's. You can go into the, you know, Savannah Rolas. You can go into revivalists, the Wesley's Whitfield. What you will find is behind the catalytic moment, there was always desire. There was always a looking behind the Argentinian revival, behind the Brownsville revival. I mean, I read documents, it's in my book there, but John, John Kilpatrick said for months ahead of time, he was so hungry for revival. He was just waiting on God and strange things began to happen to him. Just like in this room, what happened to you? Strange things began to happen to him while he was praying and studying his Bible by himself in the back room. You know what I'm saying? That this is, this is, we can leave it in this room and let the thing, you know, uh, die. Or we can hear the word of the Lord. This is a catalyst. This is a situation unto something greater. And when you let God fill you, it's meant to be carried out and you become that catalyst for, for a, you know, a, a, a conversions everywhere you go. So, uh, see, and we see the progression here in this text between the waiting for power, starting with nothing but desire. You can read History of Revivalist. You'll find it. Evan Roberts just began to get so hungry for revival. Why? Because he began to have dreams. And the dreams awaken. Whew, you know, a hand coming out of the moon with the number 100,000 on it. Whoa, whoa, it began to give him faith. He was just one guy. And he had, you know how many were in his prayer meeting? Four. Was it four or six? Him? 13 and kids. Okay, but it was, I thought it was just him and his brothers and sisters at first. You know, Half of the 13 were his family. I mean, and I'm telling you, but, I, but he began to believe it. He believed it like Bo believes it. You see what I'm saying? People that can taste it before it happens. Why? Because they, they're having dreams. They're starting to envision. They're starting to, the dreams are pulling them into the, 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 the fullness of God. I think I told you last year that I one time had this prophecy a few years ago, and it was God, and he was going, don't shrink me don't shrink me don't shrink me to the level of your money don't shrink me to the level of your capacity don't shrink me i am god yeah come on come on 
Big God, big God. <laughs> and, and we all find this progression between waiting for power, the filling of the Holy Spirit with the primary, primary manifestation of dreams, visions, prophecy, and mass conversions or revival. That is like boom, boom, boom. It's in the Bible, it's in church history, it's everywhere. And so I want to show you what prophecy looks like in the Bible, the ways of God in the Bible for prophecy so that you're not, you're not overrun by your culture like Darby was, but you're in the spirit and you're discerning by the spirit. They say that the way a person can tell counterfeit money is they spend hours and hours and hours handling real money. So that as soon as a counterfeit comes out, they can tell by the feel. You know what I'm saying? So you spend hours and hours and hours inside the Word of God, understanding because the Bible talks about false prophets. But the Bible also talks about false apostles. The Bible talks about false teachers. I mean, there's anything that's real can have a false. So, yeah. So anyway, so uh, the, the Hosea 9 says this, the prophet is considered a fool. The inspired man or man of the spirit, a maniac, Hosea 9, 7. That is the ways of God. That's what prophets looked like, and then that's what they prophesied about themselves. Prophets and people of the spirit are considered maniacs, probably because of what they looked like and what they said, how they looked and what they said. And it says this in Moses and the 70 of the elders, the result of the Lord coming down and taking of the spirit that was on Moses and transferring it on the 70 elders was that when the spirit rested on them, what did they do? They prophesied. Their primary thing, when, when he says, Jethro's, you know Jethro's injunction, you know, what you're doing is not good, you know, you're wearing yourself out, so what you should do is gather 70 elders, so he gathers, and so that, it was actually for leadership, because Moses was wearing himself out, but when the transference of leadership came, the first thing they began to do was prophesy. Okay, and then, you know, Joshua gets jealous, because he's the next in line, suddenly a whole bunch of people can do it, He's not exclusive anymore, you know? So he's jealous. And Moses says, are you jealous for my sake? I wish all God's people were prophets. I wish all of you were prophets and that the Lord's spirit would fall on you because pro prophecy is the power to be a witness, to testify of Jesus. Okay, in the rabbinic commentary on this passage, Numbers, you know, Rabbah 15.5, we read, In this world some men have prophesied, but in the world to come all Israelites will prophesy. Yeah, okay. It's, it's, right, because the Spirit, they know, the same comment is made of Joel 2.28, which Peter quoted in Acts 2, because what's going to happen is it's going to happen to everyone, and everyone's going to prophesy. Right. This is going to happen to you one day. You know, this will happen to you, you know. Amen. So, uh, and, uh, and I want you to know the ways of God. So now I'm going to go into some scriptures and tell you what prophets look like in the Bible. Okay? And Balaam raised his eyes. Balaam, Numbers 24, 1 to 4. Balaam raised his eyes. So he looks up and boom, he goes into a vision. Saw Israel encamped according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came on him. Then he took up the oracle of him and said, the utterance of him who hears the word of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, and he begins to describe what happened to him when he was having the oracle and the vision, who falls down with eyes wide open. Whew. Trances, Old Testament, New Testament, Peter went into a trance. If you're a Gentile in this room, you get to be a believer in the one true God because Peter went into a trance and that, and that you know, that opened it up. He falls down with eyes wide open. When the Spirit of God came on him, he falls down with eyes wide open. Okay, Judges, okay. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord came on Judges, and he judged Israel. Judges 3, 9, and 10. You know, Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz, uh, Othniel, the son of Kenaz. 
uh, actually Othniel is his younger brother uh, uh, the spirit of the Lord came on Othniel and he judged Israel when he went out to war the Lord gave him into his hand he prevailed so there is a when the spirit of God comes on people there is a leadership capacity an authority to to lead to prevail over your enemies a revelation of what to do and how to get there okay judges 6 the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon he blew the trumpet he was changed into another person you know the story he had the power to gather because yeah, yeah anyway I'm not going to go into that the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah Judges 11 29 on Samson he had supernatural strength you know when it came on Elijah when the spirit of the Lord came on Elijah he could ru outrun he could run ahead of the reins there's sometimes it manifests in a supernatural strength a supernatural ability to do things you couldn't before we were in Cuba last week 10 days ago we were in the poorest area of Cuba doing a pastor's conference for Cuban pastors and there was this uh, this man, this older man in his 70s that planted, I don't know how many churches in the hill country of Cuba, 42 churches in his lifetime in a, you know, very difficult situations. And he said, when I was 20, I had never, I had not been able, I was raised not with any education at all. I could not read, I could not write. He said, but I, the spirit of God came on me. He said, and in this small meeting, he was, doing this little Bible study when he first became a, a, a believer. He was in this little tiny room, not very many people, you know, just a few of them. And they were reading the Bible and the, it came to him. And he's saying, God, I don't know how to read. I don't know how to write. And they, he opened, they, they were going through the text and everybody was reading verses and he came to his turn. And suddenly for the first, he just was asking the Lord, asking the Lord, and he could instantly read and instantly write instantly and he's been able to read and write ever since he preaches all over he's planted 42 churches and he's a teacher of the word of God not only could they speak with other tongues and know other languages you know that could be heard by the people in their own tongue at that time you know that prophetic power get enables you to do my, my I've lost all my texts so I guess I'm done <laughs> My computer just died. Uh, but I, but I, I wanted to go into church history. Every time you see revival in church history, you begin to see a, a room full of this kind of behavior. I'm telling you, there's a direct correlation between a waiting, a people that learns how to wait, that just, you know, that's that's just ready to come and do nothing but like Psalm 24, seek the face of God. It's the history of the Argentinian revival. It's the, I was in the place where the latter rain revival started in Saskatchewan. I was in the very room. You know, I was born in the hospital across the street. I believe that probably they were praying. I was born in the hospital across the street from where the power fell. And I mean, I was, I was raised Catholic. I, didn't be, I, was, I became a Christian in a cessationist church. But I believe that probably that little room was praying for people in the hospital across the street. And I believe that they were, you know, praying. And so I had this sovereign experiences as a little girl. And then, you know, then when in my 20s, this happened to me with nobody praying for me. Nobody was even praying for me, and I didn't even believe it, and I'm a skeptic, you know? I loved what um, the singer said. Where's that singer that was telling me? Jillian. Where's Jillian, the singer? No, the other singer. The singer. Katie. Yeah, is she not here? Oh, yeah. She said last year she came here for the first time. Yeah? And uh, uh, here, tell me what you told me. Yes, and she, and she said, and I was scared of you. I didn't, you know. Oh, I, I was actually so funny that God did this because I was going to try to talk to you and explain to you. I wasn't afraid of what you were doing. I was afraid of the power of your words because I was running in the opposite direction. So I didn't want to hear anything you had to say because I knew what you said would come to pass because I know that you hear from God. So I didn't want to go anywhere near you. I didn't want you to notice me. And I stayed in the back the whole time. And then I went to Max and Irma's with everyone at the very end after everyone left. And I was just talking um, with Valora and Martha. I don't know if you guys know who Martha is. You probably do. But I was just talking and wasn't even expecting anything to happen. And then I don't even know because it happened so fast. Valora got up, was like, 
like prophesied a bow and and then I just started shaking and like saying things of like all I remember is before the foundations of the earth that's all I remember and then I was shaking all over the floor and Have yeah you ever happened to you before? No. Had you ever shook before? No. Shaken? No. So uh, it was like you imparted something without you. Wow. Being you see, you, it's the Lord. It's what happens when the Spirit of God comes on people. If you look at Isaiah, whew, you know, not only does Isaiah shake, he trembles, you know, he begins shaking. Many times when God is moving like that, whole buildings begin to shake. The place where they were was shaken. The place was shaken. The mountain began to shake. Smoke comes up. You know, I mean, this, there, there's clouds that sovereignly appear because our God is amazing. I'm going to tell it. I got to tell it. She, I, I had never seen this before, ever in my entire life. We were hungry. We we're praying for fire. Mary Kay will tell it. Dan and, 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 and Chuck were at their house praying for fire. We, we, the Holy Spirit, but we want the fire. Not even know, I didn't even know about the fire. And, and she came up and prophesied at, uh, at the firestorm in Harrisburg, the Quakers are coming back to Pennsylvania. The Quakers are coming back. And it was supposed to be Lou Engle talking, and I was so disappointed because I wanted to see Lou Engle, and I didn't know who she was. Well, the, she comes up little, and she, she comes up with like a real like inward, you know, like, and her lips start shaking. I'm like, oh my God, what's going to happen? She came right over and prophesied that, right over, like I was sitting right there, right over top of me. The Quakers are coming back. I had it recorded on my phone. Now, I had a meeting uh, this group had a meeting like a week after that and all I did was play the recording of your prophecy over and over and over again so in the room was her prophesying the Quakers are coming and I don't know what I'm doing I'm just saying I believe it I believe it I believe it I believe it and Esther was there and Esther was prophesying and all of a sudden I could hear her voice in, in the back I could hear it all of a sudden my body flipped up off the ground flew you saw who else was there Nick and Trudy oh Esther was there Nick and Trudy were there huh was it scary oh my God. it was scary my body f flipped up off the ground I began to scream I was horrified and I shook and I rolled for three hours from one side of the room I could I couldn't even get near anybody because if anyone would get near me to touch me it would happen again and I would just begin to shake huh Rug burns. I pulled every muscle in my body. There was so much fire. I, I, I sweat through all my clothes. It was horrifying. I kept saying to the young, there was some young people. I, I called you on the way home. I, I'm still shaking. I couldn't drive. I had to pull over. The computer guy was in my house whenever I got home. And I said the word Jesus and I started shaking. <laughs> I couldn't even say the name of Jesus without shaking for a really long time. It was so powerful. It was so powerful. Why am I telling all this? Well, it's gonna ha it's gonna happen. It's transferable. They carry it. They carry the spirit of prophecy, and it's gonna happen to some of you today, today, right now. But you know what? That prophesying power, that spirit of the Lord that came on me, I was completely, I was delivered, set free from pornography, different things that I was like fasting for, and the Lord completely washed me clean, set me, filled me with fire, with pro with witnessing power, power to witness, power to take the gospel.